In this lecture presentation, we'll discuss cognitive function and cognitive dysfunction. As always, I recommend having the slides available so you can take notes as we go, and also to have the interactive study guide nearby so you can complete the questions as we move through the lecture presentation. We'll start by discussing the lateralization of the brain. Lateralization refers to the division of labor between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of the brain. Information crosses from one hemisphere to the other through tracts of white matter, the most notable of which is the corpus callosum, but in addition to the corpus callosum, there are also tracts known as commissures. Most functions of the brain are contralateral, that is, what happens on the right side of the brain affects the left side of the body and vice versa. Some examples of contralateral functions include skin receptors, muscles except those in the trunk and the face, and vision. An example of an ipsilateral function is smell. Examples of functions that are both contralateral and ipsilateral are taste, hearing, and the muscles of the trunk and the face. Why would the auditory system use both sides? The answer to that is for localization of sound. It's important that both ears are receiving information and then transmitting that information across the lobes. The auditory system is slightly stronger for incoming information in the contralateral ear. In terms of left hemisphere versus right hemisphere, it is inaccurate to say that anybody is left-brained or right-brained. While you might be dominant in uh, features of the left brain or the right brain, for the most part, unless you have significant brain damage, you do use both hemispheres. Left-handed people usually have left dominance, or they might have shared right-left dominance. Interestingly, left-handed people have less lateralization of the brain compared to right-handed people. Only strongly left-handed people are right hemisphere dominant. Those people tend to be left hemisphere dominant for spatial relationships. In general, the left hemisphere is dominant for speech production, and that's true for about 95% of right-handed people and about 80% of left-handed people. The left hemisphere also tends to be dominant for logic, abstract reasoning, analytic abilities, rational thinking, motor control, and language. The mnemonic for the left hemisphere is often referred to as left is for language and logic. The right hemisphere is dominant for spatial relationships, comprehension of expression and affect, body image and artistic creativity. That's why people who tend to be more creative often identify as being right hemisphere dominant. And they might even say, I'm right brained. But again, they're also using their left brain to take in information, to have motor control, to engage in those artistic endeavors, and to be able just to make it through life on a day-to-day -day basis. Now that you know a little bit about the functions of the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of the brain, Let's talk about what happens when there's damage to the right or the left hemisphere. Left hemispheric damage can cause a variety of different difficulties depending on the exact area of the damage within the left hemisphere. One of these outcomes is a condition known as aphasia, which is a loss of language abilities that occurs due to brain damage. Anomia is specifically problems recalling words or names. Apraxia is when an individual struggles to carry out some type of voluntary movement, but this inability is not due to motor deficits or sensory deficits. For example, apraxia might involve the inability to button one's shirt, despite the fact that they have the motor and sensory skills for that to be something that they should be able to carry out. Because of the contralateral functions of the brain, left hemisphere damage is also associated with right-sided sensory and motor dysfunction. In terms of right hemisphere damage, 
One of the outcomes is a condition known as agnosia. Agnosia is a loss of ability to recognize some form of a specific sensory stimulus. There are many forms of agnosia. Two of the forms of agnosia that I personally think are particularly interesting are prosopagnosia and anosognosia. Prosopagnosia is the inability to recognize somebody by their face, and anosognosia is being completely unaware of one's own illness or deficits. Spatial neglect is when an individual neglects to pay attention to the experiences on one side of the body. It's particularly common for right-sided damage to lead to spatial neglect of the left side of the body. That could be in terms of the body itself, perhaps not putting their left arm into the left sleeve of their sweater, the left side of their visual field, the left side of a timeline. They really just neglect to see that part of their visual and sensory experience and attend only to the right side. Affective abnormalities are also common with right hemisphere damage, and that's because the right hemisphere is involved in comprehension of expression and affect. Some of these symptoms might look like indifference, euphoria, depression, mania, disinhibition, or a variety of other outcomes as well. Similarly to what we talked about in terms of left hemisphere damage and the contralateral function, right hemisphere damage leads to left-sided sensory and motor difficulties. As stated on the last slide, aphasia is a loss of language abilities that occurs in response to brain damage. On this slide, we'll explore two forms of aphasia, Broca's aphasia and Wernicke's aphasia, both of which occur in response to damage primarily to the left frontal or left temporal lobe. It's the left frontal lobe in terms of Broca's and the left temporal lobe when it comes to Wernicke's. Broca's aphasia is a non-fluent aphasia. It's also referred to as an expressive aphasia or a motor aphasia. It occurs in response to left-sided damage, generally to the frontal lobe, but also to the thalamus and the basal ganglia. The non-fluent aspect of Broca's aphasia refers to impaired language production the individual has difficulty creating language, using language to express themselves. Language production comes across as slow, awkward, and notably sparse. While their language production is significantly impaired, they tend to have intact comprehension. While they can understand relatively fluently, they do tend to struggle with the use of prepositions, word endings, and complex grammar. They also have trouble understanding words that they don't tend to use, and they rely on logical guesses quite often to interpret what people are saying to them. Wernicke's aphasia is referred to as a fluent form of aphasia, and it's also referred to as receptive aphasia or sensory aphasia. Whereas Broca's area is about expression, Wernicke's aphasia is about comprehension or reception. It occurs in response to left-sided damage to Wernicke's area, which is located near the auditory cortex. It also can involve the thalamus and the basal ganglia. People with Wernicke's aphasia have impaired language comprehension in terms of speech, writing, and sign language. With that said, they do have intact articulate speech, but oftentimes will experience difficulties with anomia. They're trying to think of something and they can't quite come up with what word they're trying to come up with. To compensate for anomia, oftentimes individuals with Wernicke's aphasia will describe the thing that they cannot think of the term for. Another interesting phenomena that can occur in response to brain damage is split brain. Those of you who like to pause the recording to watch videos might pause here to watch the video, The Split Brain. You might also pause at the end of the discussion of this slide to watch the video. You'll notice on the interactive study guide, 
you'll have an opportunity to practice understanding the connection between what comes in through which side of the visual field, where that goes in terms of the hemisphere, and then the impact of that in terms of the split brain phenomena. The visual field refers to what is visible to an individual at any given moment. The optic chiasm, as you can see in the picture, is where the axons from the right half of the left eye and the left half of the right eye cross, creating an X shape. Information that comes in through the right visual field goes to the left half of each retina and from there to the left hemisphere of the brain. In contrast, information that comes in through the left visual field goes to the right half of each retina and from there to the right hemisphere. It's fascinating to learn about the various impacts of damage to the white matter tracts that connect the right and the left hemispheres. We learn a lot about lateralization of the brain from these split brain patients. Dyslexia is a relatively common, though very poorly understood, impairment that relates primarily to reading. This impairment is not due to vision, motivation, cognitive ability, education, or intelligence. Individuals with dyslexia often struggle with reading and writing. Unfortunately, this is sometimes misunderstood as an intellectual impairment or some kind of misfit for traditional education. I would argue that the failure is on the side of the educational system rather than on the side of the individuals with dyslexia. Individuals with dyslexia are oftentimes highly curious, creative, intelligent, motivated, and have a host of other positive attributes just like individuals without dyslexia. In individuals with dyslexia, the temporal cortex tends to be larger in the right hemisphere compared to the left hemisphere. It may also relate to impaired auditory memory and visual attention. The visual system of individuals who have dyslexia tend to be particularly sensitive to letter crowding, and this may have to do with a skew towards the right visual field, which is discussed in detail in your textbook. There are numerous types of dyslexia, and your book divides them into dysphonetic and disidetic. Dysphonetic refers to trouble sounding out, whereas dysidetic refers to an individual who can sound it out but doesn't recognize sight words. It is possible to have both forms. In terms of specific types of dyslexia, deep dyslexia is when an individual reads a word as something with a similar meaning. For example, instead of reading the word coat, they might read jacket. Deep dyslexia refers to difficulty with semantics, the actual meaning of words. Surface dyslexia is trouble with word recognition and pronunciation. Surface dyslexia comes with a tendency to mispronounce irregular words. For, exa for example, come may be mispronounced as comb. Phonological dyslexia is difficulty reading non-words, so made-up words can't be sound out in the same way that other people without dyslexia might be able to. Phonological dyslexia is more about word sounds. For example, funtimeme would be a difficult word to sound out for an individual with phonological dyslexia. The neglect form of dyslexia is when an individual might misread the first or the last half of a word. So when they see SL, they might see slat rather than slap. There are many types of dyslexia and they all impact individuals differently. If you're interested in dyslexia, I encourage you to watch some YouTube videos about it. There's a lot of excellent information out there, including the TED-Ed video, What is Dyslexia? There are also a lot of celebrity interviews that give some first-hand information about what it's like to experience dyslexia. Individuals like Richard Branson, Kira Knightley, Jamie Oliver, all talk openly about their experiences with dyslexia, and they highlight the many advantages that come with having dyslexia. 
which I really love because we have a tendency to think of it as a disorder rather than just a difference in how we experience the world. There might be disadvantages, but there are advantages as well. Before we move to the next slide, I'd like to see if you can draw a penny. You've seen many pennies throughout your life. I'm sure, to some extent, you know what it looks like. But can you pause the recording and draw a penny? Do you know which way the face is facing? Do you know where the date goes? What other information is on there? So how did that go? Was it easier than you thought or harder than you thought? My guess is that you found it relatively difficult because most people do. Even though we've seen pennies many, many times in our lives, we don't fully pay attention. And that brings me to the next topic, attention. Attention is the process of directing and focusing our psychological resources towards a certain goal. It's the ability to direct our cognitive resources toward or away from a given stimulus. Do you think that we need to decide to pay attention? The answer is not necessarily. As you might have noticed, not paying attention to what a penny looked like made it difficult to be able to recall it when you need it. But the last time you were in a car, can you remember what the traffic was like? Most likely you can, even though you probably didn't consciously decide to pay attention to that. Because we are faced with so many different aspects of our experience at any given time, we experience selective attention. Selective attention refers to the fact that we can only pay attention to certain things at certain times. Just like with the penny test, because we have not consciously attended to that information, we haven't really encoded any memory about it, what it specifically looks like in our long-term memory storage. Maybe you'll find it easier to find the correct penny out of this list of options. This is essentially the difference between fill in the blank and multiple choice. In case you're curious and you're not quite sure, the right answer is A. Selective attention is an important concept because what we pay attention to determines what we notice and what we hold on to about our world and our experiences. As I said earlier, we can't attend to everything at the same time. That means when you're anxious, you might be paying more attention to the quality of your thoughts rather than what's going on around you. So when all your friends are talking about what they ate at the last time you got together and you can't remember that, it's not that you have poor memory, it's probably that you weren't paying attention to that aspect of your experience. Another example of selective attention is the cocktail party effect. The cocktail party effect is essentially the fact that if you were in a big, uh, crowded and loud party and you were having a conversation with a few people, you would be able to hear that conversation clearly and all of the conversation around you would become white noise until you hear your name at the other side of the room and all of a sudden, it's like a pin drop. You can hear everything happening in that conversation even though there's 20 other conversations between where you are and between where they are. That's a perfect example of selective attention. We don't even notice that we can hear those other conversations until something piques our interest, like our name. One story that relates to me when I was in college and you might not have noticed this if your name is not Ashley, but Ashley sounds very similar to actually. So occasionally in class, I wouldn't be fully paying attention and I'd be sitting there and I'd hear actually, and I think I'd hear my name and I would look up and, you know, and panic and startle. And then after the pause, cause there's often a pause after actually, the professor would go on with what he or she was talking about and I would realize it wasn't about me at all. Another thing about selective attention that's interesting is that a lot of people have trouble remembering people's names and often that's because we're not really paying attention when they tell us the first place. If you struggle with remembering people's names, it's a really great strategy to repeat it back to them. So if they say, hi, I'm Bob, you say, hi, Bob, my name is Ashley. 
Just that simple act of repeating their name back ensures that you are paying attention. It also gives the person a chance to say, oh no, not Bob, it's Rob. So you don't have to embarrass yourself next time. For those who like to pause the recording to watch the videos, I encourage you to pause here to watch the two videos on the same page of selective attention. I put both on the same page because they're very, very short videos, but they give you some great insight into selective attention and they're pretty fun, at least in my opinion. If you haven't quite had your fill on selective attention quite yet, I'd like to introduce you to the Stroop effect. The Stroop effect directions are quite simple. As quickly as possible, say the color of ink each word is printed in. Pause here and see how it goes. The Stroop effect shows us that it's difficult to read the color of ink and ignore the word that is actually written. It's difficult because the brain wants to respond to the most salient stimulus, which is the word. So our attention is necessarily divided. Interestingly, this is much easier for children who are learning or have just learned how to read. As adults, we have to enhance the activity of our color vision areas and suppress the areas that identify words. For the remainder of this lecture presentation, we're going to discuss executive functions and what happens when those executive functions go wrong in the case of ADHD. Executive functions are those cognitive processes that are necessary for goal-directed behavior, thoughts, and emotions. You might decide to pause the recording here to read the article Executive Functions, or you might wait to read that later on. Executive functions is really an umbrella term, but it includes a lot of different specific strategies. One of those is impulse control, the ability to stop yourself, to think something through before acting on it. Also includes flexible thinking, being able to apply different strategies in different situations. Working memory, the ability to hold information in mind and to manipulate that information is also an example of an executive function. Self-awareness and self-monitoring, the ability to know what you're doing, feeling, thinking, and how you are going about solving problems and making choices in your life are also examples of executive functions. Executive functions also include things like planning, prioritizing based on goals, values, and deadlines, emotional control, being able to sit with your feelings and to resist the temptation to act on them, task initiation, getting something started, and organization. Next, we're gonna talk about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, and what happens when these executive functions don't operate as they do for individuals who do not have ADHD. I'll be honest, as a psychologist and as a college level instructor, individuals with ADHD are oftentimes my favorite to work with. ADHD gets a bad rap and is oftentimes associated with a lot of educational difficulties and behavioral problems. While it is true that ADHD comes with its own risk factors and difficulties, ADHD is also associated with a lot of brilliant strengths and advantages. If you like to pause the recording to watch videos, you might pause here to watch the video ADHD Essential Ideas. When you think of ADHD, what do you think of? It's possible that you think of the child in your class growing up who had trouble staying in his seat, or maybe the person who zones out and has trouble paying attention. It's important to note that while attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is inclusive of hyperactivity, not everyone who has ADHD experiences that symptom. There are actually two specifiers that can come along with an ADHD diagnosis. You can have ADHD inattentive type, where you do not experience hyperactivity. You can have hyperactive type, where perhaps you don't have the inattentive symptoms. 
And lastly, you can have the combined type, where you have inattentive symptoms as well as hyperactivity. People with ADHD tend to have certain structural and functional abnormalities. That includes reduced brain volume and reduced connectivity between various brain regions. This is specifically notable in the striatum of the basal ganglia, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. Functionally, another aspect of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is low activity of the neurotransmitters dopamine and norepinephrine. This is associated with a very powerful genetic component. The research shows that if you have two parents with ADHD, there is a 90% chance that you will have ADHD as well. The genetic predisposition is primarily linked to the decreased activity of dopamine. This occurs in response to the dopamine receptor and the dopamine transporter. In terms of the dopamine receptor, referred to as the DRD4, it is less sensitive to dopamine. The dopamine transporter, DAT1, is longer than it is in individuals without ADHD, and that means it's more efficient. And while efficiency is usually a good thing, in this case, it means it removes dopamine too fast from the synapse, so it can't have the effect it might normally have. When you combine an insensitive receptor with a super fast acting transporter, you have functionally very low levels of dopamine activity. And as we talked about in terms of the teenage brain, that comes with sensation seeking, it comes with impulse control difficulties, and it comes with a um, sense of boredom that can lead to some problematic behaviors. If you look at the image, you'll see a uh, curvilinear relationship. And essentially what that means is that too much or too little can be a bad thing. Too little norepinephrine and dopamine, because of their stimulating nature, leaves a person feeling fatigued. They're likely to not get things done, and they're likely to have trouble particularly with initiation of projects. When you have too much um, norepinephrine and dopamine, you end up feeling really stressed. It's difficult to pay attention, you're jittery, it's um, impulsive, it can be very hard to get things done. At the top of the curve is the optimal level of norepinephrine and dopamine activation. That's where we feel alert but not overwhelmed and not fatigued either. With individuals without ADHD, it's easier to find that sweet spot. Those with ADHD often need to use strategies, which might include medication, to help find that optimal level. So what is the impact of ADHD? Unfortunately, ADHD is linked to poor outcomes when it is unsuccessfully treated. And I do want to make a strong point that not managing ADHD can lead to poor outcomes, but it's not a guarantee that people with ADHD are going to experience these poor outcomes. When properly managed, there are really amazing strengths associated with ADHD that we'll talk about at the end of the slide. Some of the poor outcomes associated with unsuccessfully treated ADHD include about a third who do not finish high school, about half who abuse drugs and or alcohol. That half should make some logical sense because what we know about drugs and alcohol is that it leads to a spike in dopamine activity. For individuals whose dopamine activity is extremely suppressed, that rush helps them feel alive to an extent that many of us feel without the use of drugs and alcohol. And that's also where medication comes in as a potential way of balancing out that norepinephrine and dopamine activity so that self-medication with drugs and alcohol is less likely to occur. Poor interactions with peers and authority figures is a uh, very common and very debilitating aspect of ADHD. Peer-related issues often lead to poor self-esteem, which can then further escalate issues with peers. Oftentimes, kids with ADHD in particular 
will try to overcompensate with ego bragging, which, as many of you probably know, tends to make the problem worse. They also tend to have limited self-awareness. So rather than recognizing that this is creating issues, there's a tendency to blame others, which leads to further issues with peers and to issues with authority. Impairments in development of self-esteem and self-image do relate to issues with peers and authority figures, but it's more than that. Imagine being the student who's falling behind in terms of their peers and doesn't understand why. Or perhaps they're getting a lot of feedback of, they would be really great if they just tried harder. Now, if you know you're trying your best and you continually get the message that you could do great if you'd try harder, that does lead to the deterioration of self-esteem. You're having trouble with your friends, you're having trouble with your teachers, trouble with your parents, and trouble with school. There's increased risk of obesity, difficulties with jobs, higher rates of divorce, higher rates of jail, and higher rates of further comorbidities that are associated with ADHD that is unsuccessfully managed. Impulsivity and poor executive functions, when combined, do lead to a much greater risk of engagement in risky behaviors. That means there's a heightened level of unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted infections, car accidents, illegal activities, and a host of other issues. As I mentioned before, ADHD is associated with many strengths when it's properly managed. Individuals with ADHD tend to be highly creative, out-of-the-box thinkers. They're spontaneous, courageous, passionate, and curious. People with ADHD make some of our best first responders. They're great EMTs and trauma surgeons and firefighters. And that's because individuals with ADHD often feel their best in situations that are highly stimulating. Part of the response to stimulation is an increase in the activity of dopamine and norepinephrine. So while some people might feel overwhelmed in those environments, individuals with ADHD are more likely to perform their best when they are under stress. In terms of creativity, it also relates to the pathophysiology of ADHD. Individuals with ADHD are creative because there is low activity of the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex helps keep us in line and it's a great executive of the nervous system, but at the same time, it does limit our ability to think creatively and out of the box. Because of the low activity in the prefrontal cortex for individuals with ADHD, the potential for creative connections and innovation is heightened. There's a common misconception about ADHD that it is a primarily childhood disorder. While ADHD is typically diagnosed in childhood, the symptoms do tend to exist throughout the lifespan. For those of you who like to pause the lecture to watch the videos, you might pause here to watch the video Adult ADHD Experience. In terms of statistics, about 7 to 8% of children in the United States are diagnosed with ADHD, and that number drops to about 4 to 5% of adults. Many people point to the fact that worldwide, the rates of ADHD are lower than they are in the United States. And while that is true, it's not as dramatic as people make it out to be. In fact, the worldwide estimate is about 5 to 8% of children. One of the major interpretations as to why the U.S. has higher rates of ADHD than the majority of the world is that we have a lot less time for play and exercise. Children are sitting in classrooms for up to eight hours a day. They're expected to sit still and to use strategies that they're really not developmentally prepared for. We also rob them of the ability to have outlets that help them manage their ADHD, including exercise, time for play, and immediate feedback that occurs more in smaller classrooms. One of the reasons why the rate of adult ADHD is lower than childhood ADHD is that many individuals learn how to manage their ADHD throughout their lifespan. Also, as we mature, sometimes the symptoms of ADHD do are not come across as pronounced as they do during childhood. 
Another explanation for the change is that the DSM, which is used to diagnose mental health conditions, is particularly sensitive to childhood presentations. For example, one symptom of adult ADHD is reckless driving, but that doesn't appear in the uh, symptom checklist of ADHD in the DSM. Misdiagnosis is very common when it comes to ADHD, and there are many reasons for that. One of them is that the symptoms appear similar to a lot of other diagnoses. As I mentioned before, people with ADHD oftentimes experience peer issues and self-esteem issues, and that can look a lot like anxiety or depression. It can also look like a learning disorder, which unfortunately are very commonly comorbid with ADHD. Symptoms can also be due to a variety of underlying causes. It's hard to know why a person is struggling with things like hyperactivity and inattention. Symptoms also exist on a spectrum. It's not as easy to say you have or you do not have ADHD. There are people with mild cases who are oftentimes missed. In general, ADHD is underdiagnosed in girls, in introverted males, and in anyone with pure inattentive type. One of the major reasons for this is that it's often teachers who are frustrated with their student who has ADHD who are the primary referral source. Quiet, introverted students and those who are inattentive don't come across as a classic case of ADHD because they're sitting in their seats. These kids are more likely to get the if they would apply themselves they would do better or they're spacey or they daydream a lot rather than to get a referral for an ADHD evaluation. The referral bias is about six to nine boys are referred to every one girl. And from there, boys are diagnosed three times more often. Another reason it can be challenging is it's hard to determine what the appropriate maturity level of a child should be. Because individuals with ADHD have an underfunctioning prefrontal cortex, it creates other problems also. So kids with ADHD tend to be about three to five years behind their age in terms of their maturity. They might just come across as immature when they really have ADHD underlying that immaturity. The nature of issues in terms of ADHD tend to persist throughout the lifespan, but the domains of responsibility change. So as adults, people with ADHD don't tend to struggle with issues with their teachers anymore, but it might be their spouse instead. So whereas childhood issues tend to occur mostly at school with parents and with peers, with adults, you see those symptoms playing out in terms of poor money management and impulsive spending, issues at work with bosses and coworkers, issues with driving in terms of road rage or um, erratic driving patterns, and issues in romantic relationships. If the partner does not understand ADHD, it's very likely that romantic problems are going to occur. It does take understanding and insight to know what is ADHD and what is an issue in the relationship. When it's not treated or managed, individuals at any age can be highly impulsive, self-sabotaging, ineffective, and unstable. They often have issues with relationships, maintaining jobs, and substance use disorders are quite common. But again, I want to point out that many people with ADHD are highly successful and effective in their lives. It is not to say that ADHD is predictive of a bad life. It does mean that certain strategies need to be implemented, which might include medication, and we'll discuss those treatment approaches on the next slide. But I do want to remind you that ADHD is associated with really amazing qualities and people with ADHD can be extremely successful individuals. So what can somebody with ADHD do to help themselves? Or as parents, what can we do to help children with ADHD? Psychosocial interventions have proven to be highly effective for ADHD. That includes behavioral therapy, particularly reinforcement. When reinforcement is quick, children with ADHD respond best. That
That means we need to be on the lookout for the times that they are making good choices and to as immediately as possible reinforce that behavior with positive comments, star charts, rewards, or anything else that helps that child feel noticed and reinforced for their positive behavior. High intensity exercise is also profoundly helpful for individuals with ADHD at all ages. High intensity exercise helps stimulate the brain and provides them the necessary chemicals to have more control over themselves and to have better executive functioning. I mentioned immediate feedback as being very important. Novelty is also important. You might have heard various people in your lives if you've been exposed to ADHD say that, let's use Johnny as a name, let's say Johnny has ADHD and the mom is complaining because Johnny is great for his grandfather or even Johnny's great with his dad. And a big part of that is not that Johnny actually has the self-control and self-awareness to be good in certain situations and to be bad, so to speak, or to let their ADHD symptoms uh, present themselves when they're with mom. Well, it's understandable that people come to this conclusion. It's novelty that explains the difference. Johnny can hold himself together for a few minutes or a few hours when he's with somebody new. Part of that is it's a shorter period of time, so that's easier to accomplish. And part of it is that there's novelty and stimulation associated with that newness. Many people of all ages also benefit from skill building and exercises to help improve self-esteem. In terms of skills, it's really important that people with ADHD learn explicitly how to improve their social skills. They often want to have positive social interactions, but lack the skills to actually make those happen. Study and organizational skills and self-awareness skills are also very important. Accommodations in school and work settings is another approach to helping individuals with ADHD reach their potential and find success in life. Some accommodations that can be helpful for ADHD include having harder classes earlier in the morning, having less homework, longer time to take tests, fidget tools, more frequent breaks, and more immediate feedback. In terms of medication, there are stimulant and non-stimulant options. Stimulant options are the most widely researched and are the most used medications in child psychiatry. And they're the treatment of choice for ADHD for the last 25 years in the United States. Stimulant medications are subdivided into forms of methylphenidate and forms of amphetamine. Methylphenidate includes medications like Ritalin and Concerta. Amphetamine includes Adderall, Dexedrine, and Vyvanse. Stimulants are all controlled substances. They are Schedule II on the DEA scheduling. That means they have abuse potential, and because of that, the prescription must be handwritten every month by the physician. Non-stimulant options do not tend to work as well for more severe cases of ADHD, but they do work for more mild cases, and they work overall about 40% of the time. The three primary non-stimulants that are used for ADHD treatment include adamoxetine, guanfacine, and bupropion. Bupropion is not allowed to be used in children, but is commonly used for adult ADHD. Adamoxetine's brand name is Stratera, so if you've heard it, you probably know it by that name. Stratera is a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Guanfacine is actually a medication used for hypertension, which is high blood pressure, but it works well for the impulsivity and hyperactivity symptoms of ADHD. It does not unfortunately work well for inattentive symptoms. Bupropion is brand name Wellbutrin, and it's traditionally thought of as an antidepressant. Bupropion is an NDRI, norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor. And because of that, it can be helpful for adult ADHD, particularly when it's a relatively mild case. I do want to remind everyone that when it comes to diagnoses like dyslexia and ADHD, while they are diagnosable conditions, I prefer to think of them as differences in learning and differences in how we experience the world. While they tend to be a mismatch for the American educational system and for many work environments, 
They are not problems or disorders in the sense of brain damage. They are instead alterations in the way the brain functions that are associated with some positive and some challenging qualities as well.